Dear Madam Minister, dear board members of Europa Nostra, of the Kaluste Gulbenkian Foundation, the Centro Nacional de Cultura and the Clube Portugues, the Imprensa, dear members of the jury, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first express how honored and grateful I am to be standing here tonight and receiving the renowned Elena Vaz da Silva European Award for raising public awareness of cultural heritage. I also wish to congratulate Antonia Arslan for the special recognition given by the jury for her role in defending Europe's cultural heritage through literature and through defending human and cultural rights, especially those of female writers. I would have very much, I would very much have liked to know the inspiring Elena Vaz da Silva, who I understood, her name is Elena, that means that she's the most beautiful woman, and da Silva means she's from the forest, so the most beautiful woman of the forest, what do you want more? But moreover, Helena Silva was a very good friend of the admirable Marguerite Yourcenar, who was born in my city, Brussels. So I feel, feel very well surrounded tonight, standing in the footsteps of these strong women. At some point on their path, any artist will come to the question, what is that they do and what their medium means to them? The examples are endless. Constantine Brancusi said, there are some fools who define my work as abstract, yet what they qualify as abstract is that which is the most realistic. It is not the appearance that is real, but rather the idea, which is the very essence of things. Trisha Brown said that dancing on the edge is the only place to be. Steve Reich said, I discovered that the most interesting music of all was made by simply lining up the loops in unisono and letting them slowly shift out of phase with each other. Patti Smith asked herself, why can't I write something that would awake the dead? That pursuit is what burns me most deeply. And Joseph Boyce, writing on the anatomical, writing on the anatomical drawings of Leonardo da Vinci said, we have to come back to the body, to the organs, if we want to speak about culture. And finally, Fernando Pessoa wrote, I don't know what I feel or I want to feel. I don't know what to think or what I am. It's often in moments like these, addressing an audience, that one has to articulate what they do and why they do it. However, I realize this questioning is just as necessary for me every day work in the studio. It's a constant companion. Throughout my career, the attempt to express what choreography means to me and how I'm in partnership with it has always been moving, shifting, changing. It sort of dances along with me. At different stages, different definitions of choreography have taken central focus, directly impacting the work I create. First, there was the idea that choreography, choreographing is embodying an abstraction. Abstraction from the Latin word abstraere, taking away. And this involved an obsession with the numerical, the geometric, and formalism. Next, there was the idea that choreographing is the organization of time and space. And this involved the return to the human body, to the basics of how movements, humans move. Walking, breathing, standing, falling, lying. And there also has been the definition of choreography as a means to defy gravity, as something that is between Isaac Newton and spinning and jumping like a child. And more recently, there has been the idea that choreographing can be a form of healing. 
Even though each of these ways of relating to my craft has taken priority and at a certain time the previous definitions never disappear, we carry the knowledge we have gained with us in work just as in life. And in front of you today, I'm still asking myself these questions. Due to the crisis we find ourselves in, they have become even more crucial than before. When COVID-19 began, everything we thought we knew was destabilized, and how we choose to live was destabilized with it. These unsettling times raised questions to many people working in many different fields, and also to the basis of how we go about our daily lives. Speaking as a choreographer, an artist in the field of live performance, and most importantly, a dancer, the questions became of unavoidable importance. When will we do it again? Where will we do it again? Why dance? When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly is over, is done, when the battle's lost and won? That will be ere the set of sun, where the play is upon the heat there to meet with Macbeth. On this search for a possible definition of choreography, one strategy I've used before is to look at the word, at the root of the word. Choreography is a fusion of two Greek concepts, namely kore, meaning choir or troupe, group of people, and graphine, meaning to write. In this sense, the etymology of choreography is a matter of writing the people, which can also be seen as a writing the space between people. Therefore, possible definition, choreography is a question of how to organize a group of people, a multitude. And with this in mind, I think about how COVID-19 has pulled choreography from the studio into a more public sphere. What we see during this pandemic is a peculiar kind of choreography. We are in the multitude, carefully executing a performance of sanitary procedures. In this choreography, we have seen distance and mistrust between bodies, a lack of touch, rituals of entering, exiting, screening. This choreography is specified even down to the costumes we all wear now, our masks, our COVID masks. Given the reality we experience today, daily, COVID-19 easily becomes the number one problem to solve. But I'm absolutely convinced this is a short-sighted thinking. There are underlying issues that cannot be ignored. Climate change, ecology, education, migration, healthcare, the growing wealth gap. These are issues that are truly at the top of the list and must be treated with more urgency than they are currently are. As I'm speaking, the second week of the UN Climate Change Conference is underway in Glasgow. We are facing huge challenges as humanity and we can only overcome them if we share a sense of standing together. One of the major challenges is the extreme loss of animal and plant species. More than a million species are on the brink of extinction. And in the end, we might be one of them. Connected to the problems of pollution, climate change, and the abusive character of our economy on our planet, we are in a dangerous place. We destroy our environment, we destroy ourselves. It has never been more important for world leaders to come together as a team, acknowledge the full weight of this crisis, and put wise plans in action to do something about it. And to quote Shakespeare again, this time in the voice of Titania, the fairy queen in A Midsummer's Night, the human mortals won their winter cheer. No night is now with him or Carol blessed. Therefore the moon, the governance of floods, pale in her anger, washes all the air that rheumatic diseases do abound. And through this distemperature, we see the season alter. With my ongoing quest to articulate what it is that I do, there is inevitably always this question of why? Why choreography? Why should I dance? Why dance? The questions of 
why waits more and more as a mode of doom thinking increases? Why am I dancing and choreographing with all this happening around me? What can my work do to help? Can it help? Should it help? And there are many moments it makes me think of that scene from the Titanic when the violinists keep playing as the ship is sinking. Doom is inevitable for them, but their music making is a way to enjoy a last burst of beauty to soothe themselves and the others around them who face all the same fate. But honestly, I don't want to think that way. I think we have the moral duty to the first thing that is not the Titanic and that we do have a future ahead of us. And when, and we cannot say, as they say in French, après nous le déluge, because I believe that maybe choreography has the potential to offer more than just soothing. I think we can learn from it too. In the current climate, it can feel as if everything to do with sharing, with sharing is under threat and at the speed of this is accelerating as difficulties of the world pile up. How do we relate to each other as individuals or, individuals or a collective, as a continent or a globe? The number of people living in cities is steadily increasing, meaning the planet is becoming one big city, this polis, this Greek word which leads to the word political. The space between people is changing. We are getting closer and closer to each other, yet at the same time, we are becoming more and more individualistic, screened off by technology, and not to mention afraid of others' bodies. In my dance, I often think about the vertical and the horizontal axis and all the possible diagonals between it. The vertical axis, what connects us between heaven and earth, keeping us grounded with gravity, but simultaneously uplifting us. In dance, we can try to defy gravity, to fly, which according to the late American choreographer, Tricia Brown, is the most beautiful movement. The horizontal axis is the realm of the social. It's where we reach out to our neighbors, where we embrace, we support, we're providing support when necessary. This happens in dance, but also in daily life. Unfortunately, the way we use the horizontal axis is becoming increasingly complex. There is the necessity to distance ourselves from each other, but less room to do so. I believe the matter of how to organize the people needs re-evaluation and re-imagination. How are we going to live together with so many people? How we are going to reorganize the people and I strongly believe what we need is a reset to make radical shifts in order to stabilize the planet and its people. Calls for the reset of our society have become remarkable widespread across the political spectrum, along with our increasing incapacity to imagine collective solutions to collective problems. Dance lovers and choreographers probably hear their own references here to Set and Reset, which is one of Trisha Brown's most important pieces. It sells you to the music, beautiful music of Laurie Anderson, who provided the score, long time no see. Brown's piece, which premiered in 1983, is a beautiful metaphor for the ways in which human beings both order and reorder their world. It's one of the greatest works of postmodern dance, full of complex movement and intricate composition. And there is plenty for us to learn from. It exemplifies the power of imaginative thinking, improvising and inventing. The world needs to rewrite itself not to rewind, but to reset for a better future, using ancient wisdom and modern insight. As with any art making from choreography, we can learn about decision making. The work of a choreographer implies making many choices. Sometimes these are very large decisions that have a huge impact on where the piece will go. For example, what music I'm gonna work with, choosing to work with drumming by Steve Reich, as you saw. I did it in 1998, opposed to Bach's Goldberg variations, which I will be dancing here in 
March, April, as I have recently done, lead to entirely different works. Other decisions are so small and precise that you, in the audience, may barely have noticed the alternative. For example, shall my gaze reach up or down? It's in, it seems like an insignificant detail, but I assure you it is not. Just as each word in language means something, specific body language isn't the same, and the way the gaze can sculpt the space is extremely powerful. Decision-making is everywhere in our daily life. We are constantly making choices that affect our own lives, but also around us on both micro, on micro and micro levels. We know all too well how big decisions made by people in power, by politicians, can impact our lives. But also the smaller decisions can also have a large impact, just like I experience when I choose to hold my fingers this way or that way in dance. A figure that has been with me since my very earliest works, you just saw it, is the spiral. Spirals are figures of life and change. In every spiral, the closing is also the opening. There is the double helix of our deoxyribe nuclear acid, the opposite spirals. And I'm very interested in circles too. I like the idea that the circle is the most democratic figure because when standing in a circle, everyone is of equal distance of the center. It's no coincidence that dancing often happens in a circle and it has been like that in cultures around the world for as long as we know. But the image I really would like to share with you today is that of concentric circles. Multiple circles widening around shared center. The central point, the eye of the storm, is both the ultimate movement and the ultimate stillness while the circles around grow bigger and bigger. Think of a circle as something closed off internal like a bubble, is easy to do. But what I like about concentric circles is the expansion outward, all while sharing a common center. A natural example of concentric circles would be dropping a stone in water and seeing the ripples spread out. Just like a small stone small-scale choice-making will inevitably lead to concentric circles. Sometimes it's easy to fall into pattern of thinking that nothing you do has an impact. But I found that rather than letting oneself be demotivated like this, it's better to think on a different scale. If we zoom in, we see that even the smallest actions or choices can have the largest effect, reaching far as it ripples outward. Each of us, as individuals, has a part to play in the wider community, no matter how small our actions may seem. Or to say it with Greta Thunberg, no one is too small to make a difference. In preparation of this speech, I was looking into the work and history of Europa Nostra, and I learned how the risk of flooding in Venice and the potential destruction of the city's heritage due to climate change was at the origin of this organization. This got me thinking about the heritage of dance and choreography and how that should be protected. It's a difficult one to dissect because as life art and life art, dance isn't of, made up of objects that can be destroyed, sold, speculated on, can't be destroyed by time or the changing climate. Dance itself can't be washed away in a flood. It can't be burned to ash in fire. Choreographies, written dances, have just like stories or songs been passed on from body to body, generation to generation for centuries. The only difference is that choreographed dance isn't recorded in writing as easily as a story or song. YouTube is the biggest library. A video recording is one thing, and the internet too, but these are recent inventions in relation to the ages humans have been dancing. As has been made evident to me, even though dance may not be made of erodible materials, it's 
heritage needs to be protected too. It was very nice last night, who was it, uh, who explained me all, you explained me about the dances in Portugal. Yeah, that was very beautiful, we looked. How do you, do you protect the heritage of dance? I think this is a matter of transmitting knowledge in order to keep that heritage alive, meaning that this is a good time to talk about education. In 1994, Bernard Foucault of the Brussels Opera, Theo van Rompuy, Case Aaron, and I came together to found the school, Parts, Performing Arts Research and Training Studios. It opened in Brussels in 1995 and has since then seen 556 students pass through its door from 66 countries around the world. Parts was built in response to what has been called the Flemish wave of the 1980s and to fill the gap that was felt due to the disappearance of mudra, the word, the Indian word for gesture, the school of Maurice Bejar. We wanted to create a school that would be a place to bring people together and build a future. Brussels, which comes from the word brook, means a swamp. Brussels is a kind of no man's land. A no man's land that is betwixt and between the pocket of urban space that bridges the north and the south, east and west. In Brussels, as demonstrated by the surrealists, there is a taste for things outside the box. The uncategorizable and the absurd. In a, some people say everything what is not allowed finds its place in Brussels, for the good and for the bad. All this made it the perfect place to make this school happen. It felt as if anything was possible with no conservative history to uphold. We started this school with youthful, youthful ambition and at the same time we were driven by a belief in the importance of education. We want to accompany and support young artists, making a possible way for them. After all, the, world, the word education stems from the Latin word educare, which means to lead out, just like these concentric circles I spoke of. And throughout these years of parts, I've seen constant change. I've learned that change tends to happen in cyclical patterns, always coming back to the similar place in a different way. When dealing with change, one constantly asks this question, what remains? Are there things what we should hold on to? Are there things we should let go of or to assist change? A school is by excellence the place where you think about the past, the present, and where you build on the future. It's a difficult thing to learn, not only as an educator, but also for the students. They came from very different backgrounds across the world. Arriving at a school with different social, physical, and mental realities, their education is just as much about human growth as it is about dance. Ultimately, dance acts as a common ground. All this being said, protecting the heritage of dance is a matter of caring for its transmission from generation to generation, nurturing its development and growth. We learn from the past and work with it in the present to reset for the future. What is essential for this to happen is the idea of leading students out into the world with all the tools they may need, both as dancers and human beings. But in order, to protect the heritage of dance, I think there is something even more vital than this topic of education, that, that is the body. Dance primarily exists in the body, and it goes without saying, and especially in the eyes of the pandemic, that the body needs to be protected too. Protecting the heritage of dance is first and foremost, foremost a matter of protecting the people. As I said before, during this past year, we have been suddenly confronted with mistrust of the body, the bodies of others, and even of our own body, which are the houses in which we live. We don't know what's happening inside ourselves. So depend on the knowledge of doctors, scientists, politicians. We worry about proximity to others. We worry about touch. We worry about being surrounded by a community. We worry about sharing breath. Unfortunately, these very things, proximity, touch, community, and breath, are all essential to the DNA of dance. 
Therefore, this crisis has hit not only the work of a professional dancer or choreographer, but also who we are on a human level. And this is maybe a good moment to share with you a final story. A final story of something I witnessed unexpectedly earlier this year. We were in Basel in March, and Rosas was invited to at the Fondation Bayler in Basel, which is a beautiful museum in Switzerland, to create a perform and perform a project which I've been developing called Dark Red. And not the dark red zone of COVID, but a project about choreographic encounters with the architecture of museum spaces and exhibitions, taking the form of live choreographic installations. And this particular exhibition was, uh, the starting point was uh, Auguste Rodin and Hans Arp, exhibited in the Fondation Bayler. And at the last day of this 10 days of exhibition performance, and after taking our final bow, bows, at the end of the last day, we gave an encore, encore. By performing a song we had been working with in this project, it was Kiss S by Prince. Kiss, of course, I don't have to explain you, was chosen simply because of the famous kiss by Auguste Rodin. And an absolute forbidden thing in times of the pandemic. As we finished and ran backstage, the bus left in the room was quite deafening. The people were highly energized, eager for more. So intuitively and instantly I asked the technicians if he could play the song of Prince through the sound system. Without exaggerating, the second the song was playing, the people surged into the space and started to dance. And I think we all know that from parties where you go, there can be often an awkward moment when the dance floor isn't warm yet and people are too self-conscious to get in there and move. We look at each other, there is the desire, but we don't dare. It's an, then it's a bit like sheep. If one starts, another follows. Soon everyone will join, but it tends to take time. However, as the music started, the room immediately broke into full on dancing. Self-consciousness had given way to that sensation of celebrating in a crowd that what we were missing so much. Old people, small children, the staff of the gallery, the guards, and us dancers who came back out to join them, all dancing together, sharing a moment of uninhibited joy, moving our bodies together in collectivity. And it should, I should add, there was still there was still social distancing and face masks, so don't worry. But even with those safety measures, this exemplifies one of the vital elements of dance and what dancing is all about, community. Sharing an experience as a community and celebrating that community. And so I may come to the end, but it may sound like something that goes without saying. But at the end of the day, choreography is a celebration of our humanity. Choreographing is a means to dance together collectively. And even when dancing, you can dance a solo, you are never truly alone. That is the definition I present to you today. And I think there are many things to learn from dance that can help us in these times. How to deal with our surroundings, our time and space, how to create experience in a way that is not full of doom, destruction and selfishness, but celebration. We can learn how to relate to the body of the other, to listen to our bodies, protect and work with it rather than against it. We can learn how to share the same rhythm instead of being individualistic and how to celebrate our humanity again. Dancing is something we all know. A child can dance, even before somehow it can walk or speak. And without a doubt, every single person in this room is familiar, is familiar with it in his own very way, just like were the people at the Fondation Bayler. Also, dancing in solitude, solitude is one thing. We can dance in quarantine or in self-isolation. It is fundamentally a social act. Bodies moving side by side with negotiation, often to a common beat, the space, between breathing and at the still point of the turning world, 
neither flesh nor fleshless, neither from nor towards, at the still point there the dance is, but neither arrest nor movement, and do not call it fixity, where past and future are gathered, neither movement from nor towards, neither ascent nor decline, except from the point, the still point, there would be no dance, and there is only the dance. T.S. Eliot. And last time, Shakespeare. Shall I, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of me, and summer's lease had all too short the days. Sometime the eye of heaven shines, and sometime shines a Nor shall Death brag to wondrous in his shade when in eternal lines to time do grows. So long as man can breathe and eyes can see, as long lives this and this gives life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm.